Hi, and welcome to the Orvis Guide to Fly Fishing. I'm your host, Tom Rosenbauer, and I'm a lousy stillwater angler, and we wanted to bring you a show on advanced stillwater techniques. So I have asked my friend, Phil Rowley, to pretty much host this show and teach all of us some advanced stillwater techniques. Phil, welcome to the show. Thanks, Tom, it's good to be back. And I'm looking forward to taking you out in the water, sitting down with you, talking about these advanced stillwater tactics to help improve your success on the water and everyone else as well. And maybe I can even catch a fish? I can almost guarantee you're gonna catch a fish. All right, we'll try. Oh, yeah, nice fish! That fish has already refused that fly. You're gonna to have to try just a slightly different pattern. The roll cast pickup is a great cast to use in a lot of fishing situations. This is a beautiful wild trout from a small stream. Just a gorgeous little fish. I say hit that bank. Let's go to that grass bed. The Orvis Guide to Fly Fishing is supported by Orvis Fly Fishing. Adipose Boat Works. Global Rescue. Trout Unlimited. Oscar Blues Brewery. For many, using indicators in still waters is a primary presentation option. And for many, they think it's as simple as just putting an indicator onto a leader, attaching a fly, setting for depth, making the cast, and waiting for that pull down. But if you want to take your indicator fishing to the next level, there's a few details you need to pay attention to. The most critical aspect of successful still water indicator fishing is leader construction. Many use a standard tapered trout leader, nine or 12 feet long. You want to avoid these leaders. Those leaders are primarily designed for turning over dry flies, emergers in rivers and streams. They feature a butt section that's at least 50% of its length. It's critical to have level leader between your indicator and fly. A level leader really pays huge dividends when fishing small bugs at exact depth. So we're talking small bead heads and particularly coronamid pupa, where the change of six inches means the difference between an okay day and the day of dreams. So leader construction is critical. You make an indicator rig that's quite different from what we would use in a stream. It's, it's a lot different. Yeah, and it's also, you know, most people coming to fly fishing lakes nowadays think it's just an indicator. Oh, well, you just put that indicator on, I tie a fly on, and I go fishing. Yeah, and, yeah. And it's, for me, it's arguably the most complex leader system I built. Mm -hmm. And the, the real key to the whole method is when we're talking about indicators. Well, first of all, indicators allow you to, to me, control two of the most critical presentation elements. The depth of your presentation and the speed of your retrieve. Now the depth of your presentation is simply governed by the distance between your indicator and your flies. Mm -hmm. And the speed and the speed of your retrieve is governed by how little or how much you choose to move the fly for the situation you're in. And that's where most people struggle in lakes is they make the cast as soon as the fly hits, they're pulling it. Right. Right? And it's a I was saying you're just going to slow down. Let let things sink and let it sort of let it happen. So if you, if you start to use a, a standard tapered leader as the basis for your indicator rig, um, those leaders are primarily designed for river and stream fishing, casting dry flies. Half the leader length is butt section to facilitate a gentle, delicate turnover. Um, what we really need when we're indicator fishing in lakes is that our leader between that indicator and fly is level. Mm -hmm. So when you set it for eight feet, it's going to hang straight down at eight feet. If you use a standard tapered leader, because of its differing thickness along its length, you're going to set for eight feet, but it's actually going to come off the leader in a bit of an arc and droop down, and it's going to rob you of actual depth, if that makes sense. I usually start with about 10 feet, and then I'll add onto it after that. But if I anticipate I'm going to be fishing, uh, you know, fall conditions, where typically we're targeting water 10 feet or less, I may start with just eight feet of overall of level of, of, of level, le level and then add two. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to start with a section of 2X. Mm -hmm. It could be nylon or fluorocarbon. And I'm going to form a perfection loop 
in one end. So the next thing we're going to put on is a little rubberized bobber stop. We actually use these as a marker on the leader. So when our indicator pops and we want to go back to where it was to catch that fish, we know back to the original depth. So there's no re, you know, after every time uh, these quick release indicators we use uh, trip, we don't have to go through a whole depth setting process mm -hmm. again, either measuring or what have you. Okay. I'm going to pass, isolate the one I want, and I'm going to pass this through. And then I'm actually going to grab that bobber stop and pull on it. And I've just shown it here. It's starting to slide up the wire. And then all of a sudden it's going to fold over and go. And now I've doubled it. I've transferred it from the wire. It's now on the doubled section of uh, tippet material. And I'm just going to keep sliding it. And I'm moistening it a little bit to ease the um, pulling on it. And eventually I'll pull that tag in through. And I've effect uh, now I've transferred that onto the leader. And then I would introduce my... Uh, indicator. So these are the releasing indicators. The reason we like these so much in lakes is because if we're using a long rod, maybe nine and a half, ten feet, these indicators will release on the strike. So now you can fish deeper depths because the indicator isn't a barrier landing the fish. It's not stuck up at the rod tent. So I'm just going to thread this through. So I get this indicator where I want it to go. I'm going to pull the peg out and I'm going to hold the, the indicator in such a way with my forefinger that I, I'm not going to allow this to move. So when mm -hmm. I push the peg back towards the indicator, because that section of leader can't move, it's going to buckle and form a loop, and you mm -hmm. actually pinch that loop, just snug it in. So what happens with this indicator is when you recognize a take and you lift the rod to set the hook, and of course that drives the hook into the fish's mouth and the fish reacts by bolting, the tension of those two actions pops this. It slides all it the way slides down. slides all the way down. So the I have used this indicator to 22 feet between indicator and fly. Great. That's set up there, and now we would add a swivel, and the swivel again adds weight, and because it rotates, it uh, helps prevent tangles to some degree. Mm -hmm. uh, it adds weight. It's an inline weight system. At this point, I would be I would add fluorocarbon. So we'll take a little bit of uh, 4x in this case. Off, and I like about two feet. That goes like this. All right, and then that would go down to your fly. Mm -hmm. And again, we'd use that non slip loop knot. Tie on a balanced leech in this instance. Again, through the eye of the hook, through the loop, pull on the main line and the tag to somewhat size the loop, so it's about approximately twice the diameter of the hook eye. Wrap that around, take that tag in, through, pull it tight. So that's the whole setup. So we're set up, we're at about 12 feet of water. We want to make sure we get our fly suspending at the right depth. You always want to set your depth from the bottom and work your way up. I like to start on a flat, muddy bottom, about a foot off the bottom. If the bottom's irregular, I might be a foot and a half or even two feet. If I'm working over weed beds, long uh, vegetation growing up from the bottom, I'm going to be about a foot off the top of the weed tops. So how do we set the depth? Well, you can literally do pulls like this, two, four, six, eight, etc. Or you can use a ruler. But what I like to do is attach a weight to my fly, in this case a balanced leech, and let that weight pull the, everything down the bottom and adjust the indicator from there. Let me show you how we do that. So the weight's in place. I'm going to lower the hemostats and fly gently down. I don't want to plunge it into the mud and give myself an inaccurate reading. Hits the bottom. I'm going to grab the leader where it contacts the surface. That's the distance between my indicator and fly. That's how much my fly would be suspending off the bottom, which I don't want. I want to be about here, a foot or so off the bottom. So I'm going to slide my bobber stop into the new position, release the indicator up to the bobber stop, 
reset, re-lower, and that, just to confirm, and now my indicator is approximately two feet off the bottom, which is where I want to be because we have a little weed growth down here. So I want to make sure my fly is visible above those weeds. And that is how easy it is to set, to accurately set your fly so it's suspending at the right depth. So all I got to do now is come up, remove the hemostats, and go fishing. Presentation is important with indicators as with any fly fishing technique. I like to use long rods, minimum nine and a half, 10 foot. They give a great roll cast, which is an excellent presentation option with indicators because it's a tangle prone system. So to make the roll cast, I'm just gonna draw the rod back, keeping everything on the surface. The indicator adds drag, which helps load the rod, form the D-loop, push to a high stop, everything turns over and you're fishing. So short cast. Indicator fishing is not a long cast game. You need to be able to recognize subtle takes, particularly when they're eating small food sources like coronamids, mayfly nymphs, scuds, those kind of things. And you need to be able to react to them. If you make a long distance cast, you're probably not gonna be able to see that indicator move or pull under unless it really dives under. And even if you do, there's a time delay for you to react and you're probably not gonna hook that fish. So the deeper I'm fishing, the closer I fish that indicator towards me so I can react right away because I have to get that hook set into that fish's mouth very, very quickly. One of the techniques you want to think about when you're fishing indicators is something I call moving the strike zone. We always anchor with the wind at our back and your tendency is to cast straight downwind and always put your fly directly, in this case, below the boat. But if you could move that little circle of visibility around the fly, let's say for argument's sake, it's 10 feet. If you could move that 10 foot circle around, you're gonna expose your fly to more fish and consequently catch more fish. So how do I do that? Well, as I said earlier, moving the strike zone. So I'm going to take and place my cast. I'm a right-handed caster. So I'm either gonna overhead cast or roll cast. I can actually do a reach cast and position that indicator so it lands on an acute angle off the bow of the boat here and I'm going to let that indicator and fly just drift downstream. So if that circle of vision, that 10 foot radius around the fly moves downwind 30 feet and then I retrieve it back 30 feet, that's 600 circular feet, if that's the right unit of measure, that I've moved the fly. I should catch more fish. We want to let that fly drift slowly down we can mend by raising the rod tip up and then lowering it over like so and continue to let that fly swing down on a tight line. We don't want a big C to form in the line, a big curve. We want to keep that indicator moving down. So we mend by a, a gentle rod raise and a lift. Mend a little, mend often. And we're just going to let that drift down. Again, we do not want the big C to form because the big C speeds up the fly, and in some cases, like a river current, can actually pull the fly up out of the depth you're trying to target. So move the strike zone and you'll catch more fish. So I went to mend the fly, because when indicator presentations, we do use techniques such as mending and reach cast to make sure we have that straight line connection between ourselves and the indicator and the flies below. So I went to make a little mend, that moved the flies, indicator just dove under. We've got a fish on. Hybrid or cutthroat, rookie, we're not sure. I think it's a hybrid again. Ate the upper fly. Got that little baby leech, baby leech tied on a little jig hook and right in the mouth. Thank you, Ooh, not a bad little fish. See, there's the, I'll twist it up here, but that's the bruise leech below. And then this is the little micro leech on the dropper. Always like to put my heaviest flies on the point so they don't foul up and cause tangles. That's a beautiful hybrid from here, Henry's Lake. 
Kevin, do the honors. Wind drifting allows you to move the strike zone. It is an excellent presentation technique when using floating lines both with and without indicators as it allows your flies to cover water with a static or near static presentation. From an anchored position with the wind at your back, place a quartering reach cast to your left if you are right handed or to your right if you are left handed. This casting approach avoids having your line and leader crash into you should you lose control of the cast. It also induces the line to drift. Allow the wind induced surface current to swing the fly line downwind. Use a series of small, gentle mends to avoid having the fly line form a large C. This dreaded C makes setting the hook more difficult, speeds up the fly, and potentially raises it up out of the strike zone. Mend a little, mend often. Allow the fly line to swing directly downwind below the boat. With the fly line downwind, begin a slow hand twist retrieve to complete the presentation. When you're fishing indicators on still waters, many think it's just heave it and leave it and just let it bob up and down. And that's definitely one option. But I use four retrieve options or four presentation options when I'm fishing indicators. The first one is just what I said previously, is you cast it out and just let it sit there and let the gentle wave action bounce those flies up and down rhythmically. Often, that'll bring a fish to the fly. If you start to get bored watching the indicator, the cure for boredom is move the fly. Move the indicator through a retrieve. So we have a couple of different options. We can do a slow hand twist retrieve. Just keep bringing that fly and the indicator back towards you. That's going to track those flies back from where the flies first landed back to you and cover some water. You can also induce a take sometimes by using a long strip. So give that fly a long strip to make that indicator create a wake. That's going to raise those flies up. And as you stop, they're going to flutter back down. You always want to watch the indicator immediately after the strip because it's that movement that attracts the flies to the fish and that indicator will often dive under. The other presentation technique is upwind. It works very well with leech and minnow patterns, particularly balance flies under an indicator, where on a light wind day, you actually cast the fly upwind and let the line and leader drift back towards you. Fish tend to feed upwind in lakes, so you're now drifting flies back into their cruise path, and this can be very successful. But again, only do that in light wind situations. So you have those four presentation options. Static, slow hand twist retrieve, strip with a pause, and casting upwind. Whether you're using the strip retrieve or hand twist, water temperature is another factor that affects your retrieve speed. Generally, as the water temperatures cool, the fish's metabolism slows, you've got to use slower retrieves. So let that water temperature be your guide for your retrieve speed. fly fish lakes, one of the pattern styles you need to consider are balanced flies. What am I talking about? Well, balanced flies were designed primarily for fishing under indicators because one of the problems when you're fishing a regular bead-headed fly is it tends to hang vertically in the water. Now most food sources, leeches, minnows, damselflies, etc., they move horizontally. So this is a balanced fly. See how it hangs horizontally under an indicator? It taunts and dances and works wonderful. It's also an excellent pattern choice when you're fishing cast and retrieve techniques because the balance fly is essentially a little jig and jigs are arguably the best lure ever designed. So these flies move through the water, they pitch and undulate, a very seductive action. The trout and other fish, bass, walleye, 
Some fish like that, all like that kind of action, and it's a great fly. The balance fly concept was originated by my friend Jerry McBride from Spokane, Washington. Realizing that traditional flies suspended under an indicator hung vertically, Jerry creatively developed a pattern solution to better match the natural horizontal travel path used by the majority of Stillwater food sources. The key to a balanced fly is the chassis beneath the fly. I like to use 60 or 90 degree jig hooks. I lash a sequin pin or a common household pin and I've cut to length, generally the distance between the hook eye, sorry, the hook eye and the point. And then I slide a tungsten bead on, um, so the wide end of the tapered bead envelops the pinhead and I lash it to the shank. And I like to lash them in, regardless of hook size, about two bead widths out in front of the hook eye itself. I typically use a 1 8 bead for size 10 and 8 jig hooks and 7 64 inch bead for smaller flies. The reason we use the up eye jig hook is practicality. Once the fly is tied, we have a nice exposed eye that we can find and tie on to the end of our tippet. You can certainly use a down eye hook, but the risk is you'll obscure the hook eye when you're tying the fly. You have a wonderful balanced fly, you simply just can't tie it on. Balanced flies can be challenging to cast, especially when using thin, level indicator leaders. As with all indicator presentations, the roll cast is your best presentation option. Roll casts minimize tangles, and help promote short casts that allow you to react quickly to any signs of a take. Long distance indicator casts aren't recommended as it is difficult to see or to react to takes from a distance. A dynamic roll cast featuring a brief rod pause eases any casting challenges when using balanced flies under an indicator. When roll casting balanced flies, pull the rod back quickly so the leader and fly are up near the surface. Pause the rod just long enough for the D-loop to form. As soon as the loop forms, push the rod forward to complete the cast. Pausing too long allows the heavy balance fly to sink, making it tough to roll out of the water so you can complete your cast. I got him. Switched over to the indicator, give the arm a rest. And originally started about two feet off the bottom, or in 10, and I kept hooking weeds because there's long stemmed weeds growing in here. Came up a couple feet, and on the next sort of drift, down she went. Ate the balance leech, bruised black and blue. Black with little sort of electric blue highlights, one of my favorite colors over the years. Get all the line and leader off them. And there's a beautiful cutthroat with lots of life ahead of it to get big and fat. Let him go. It's one of those cutty high bows. Cutty high bows. Off he goes. If I had to fish a lake one way, it would be with a floating line and a long leader. Mm -hmm. We call it the naked technique, mm -hmm. simply because other floating line techniques that are used, primarily indicators, have something on the leader. Mm -hmm. So because the leader has nothing on it, hence the naked technique, that's where it comes from. But it's an excellent presentation because depending, you're playing around with four variables that we'll get into in a second, but basically I can cover water from five feet deep to over 20 feet deep. From a, an equipment perspective, uh, it's a floating line method. Right. Arguably any floating line would work, but you would want to look for a floating line that had, uh, that was designed for say, casting indicator and nymphing rigs on a river, uh, big bushy flies, wind, uh, sorry, windy conditions, those kind of things. Um, from there, the leader itself, um, we start with a, a 12 foot leader, would be a good starting point. And what tippet sizer, doesn't it? Um, I usually like to start with about 3x. Okay. You know, um, fishing trout and lakes, productive lakes are, are known for being big, and um, we're going to downsize it. So mm. that's a good starting point. We don't want it too thick, 
But what we're doing with this 12-foot leader is we're actually using the taper of this leader to help with the presentation and to control the sink rate so we get that nice steady retrieve back towards us. So from there, we just add a length of tippet to complete the overall leader. Now, it's just not an arbitrary uh, number we pick to make our leader 18 feet. Mm -hmm. We use a general rule because the way this leader comes off the line, it's gonna come off like this and then kind of droop off and tail down. So because at the, it- At the tippet part, yes. because it's thinner. Yeah, and it's so it's a bit thicker. like this, a bit of an arced profile. Okay. So you have to compensate for that with extra leader length. Mm -hmm. So we use a general rule that if you want your leader 25% longer than the water, the depth of water you're trying to target. Okay. So if I'm trying to get down to 16 feet, 16 times 25%, 1.25 is approximately 19 feet. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we would add 12 feet to this and then step it down. So we got 12. We need to get to 19. We got to add another seven. So I might add another three and a half feet of the same diameter tippet and then I might step it down one size to make the final three and a half feet, mm -hmm. okay? And that's, really fine that's your overall leader length. Okay. Um, the other uh, variable in this is um, your, your sink time. So these, this is a patience game. So my minimum sink time when I'm using this method is 30 seconds. Mm. So I make a cast and I actually use my watch as a guide. And then it's the speed of the retrieve and the retrieves are painfully slow. You know, if I was to do an example with this line here, if I was retrieving this line in, I would have the rod in my hand. I use my fingers as a, uh, as, as a control point mm -hmm. and the retrieves come from behind the hand. So I would, you know, this is a standard hand twist retrieve where right. we open, we catch with our thumb and forefinger. So when I'm using this fishing small nymphs, chronomid pupa, chronomid larva, those kind of things, I'm actually using just my ring finger, and I'm moving the fly about this fast, okay? So we retrieve this so slowly that if there are any, what I call line squiggles, mm -hmm. where there's a little memory. Yeah, there always will be a little. A little bit, because the curves. only thing that's gonna really pull those out is, is tension with you pulling. So yeah. if you pull fast, they'll straighten. So we go so slowly that they won't straighten. This is called a line take. So this would be coming back like this, just dragging, dragging, dragging. All of a sudden, the line starts to do this. Well, you know you're going so slow that you're not causing that uh, squiggle, if you will, to straighten. Then the form of tension that's coming on that line is coming from the other end, and that's a fish that's moving off. Okay. The only other consideration, of course, we've talked about uh, leader length, um, sink time, um, retrieve speed, and then it's primarily we were using weighted patterns. So small bead heads or hard-bodied uh, flies that are gonna sink quickly and get down. Because what you're trying to do, much like an indicator presentation, is track that fly back ever so slowly. That's why we have to go so slow with the retrieve because the fly will start to climb up after a while. If you go too fast, it starts to rise. So that's the four principles. You're trying to strike the variable, the balance between the, the, your leader length, your sink time, the speed of your retrieve, and then the weight of the pattern. So let's let's build one of these leaders. Sure. Show me how, show me how you put one together. So okay. You got a twelve footer. Yeah, there. we got the twelve standard foot standard twelve footer from the pack. So we're gonna say let's we we talked about um, the twenty five percent rule and and uh, so we're gonna build one about nineteen feet long that would allow us to get into that sixteen foot range. Okay. All right. So we've got uh, we're gonna take some equals. So we got twelve. So we got to add seven. So uh, this is five x. So sorry, that's a four x leader. So we'll add approximately three feet. So I like a whatever leader connection knot you like. Mm -hmm. I use a triple surgeons because I can tie it. <laughs> um, it's easy. I, for me, I, 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 I use blood knots for thicker diameter material. Mm -hmm. I find I'm better able to tie it. But I like the triple surgeons because if you're combining, I found if you combine nylon to fluoro, it's the way the knot forms, it doesn't tend to bite into nylon uh, as readily. Okay. And it's also more horizontal, so it'll pass through guides. So we just I'll moisten those two. Give yourself enough to work with. Form our overhand loop. And 
pull that through three times. And now what it's going to take, I've got a little barrel swivel here in the palm of my hand. Mm -hmm. And for that, I'm just going to use a clinch knot to attach it. And just give it a nice, smooth, firm, that's going to hold. Trim. I see in this light here is some of the issue. And now we'll step down and go to the 5X right here. So how many feet did you put on there? About you put three, three, so we'll go about, let's go about four or five, because I put a little extra on, because I got to factor a couple of fly changes, that kind of thing. I've got a little, um, a little flexibility. So this is the same. Back through. Again, give yourself enough material to work with. Quickly go around, back through. Snug. A little bit of saliva, not dripping. And then from there, you just add whatever fly you'd want on. So there's your whole leader. So we've got, if we go from the fly would go on here. Mm -hmm. Now, if you were gonna do two flies, would you tie the second fly in line? No, I, uh, I, am a, I like to fish flies off separate droppers so they can both work independently of each other. So I like the non-slip loop knot. So the flies, no matter what flies I'm tying on, they have freedom of movement. So a lot of people find, when I talk to them, they're, they're always concerned about loop size. Make them want that nice. Yeah. So what I do is once I've formed a loop and I push the fly on and I don't, some people fuss around with uh, down or up or through, I just get it on, right? Now, after every step, you always go through that loop. So I've done something, I go through the loop. Okay, so I put that tag in through the overhand loop. And this point, I, I size the loop a little bit. So what I'm gonna do is a combination of pulling on both the main line and the tag, I'm gonna try and shrink that loop down to about twice the diameter of the hook eye. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to pull on the tag end. And now I've got both that loop and fly in my thumb and forefinger. Grab carefully, you know, hook yourself in the tongue and just snug it tight. And when the knot is seated correctly, the tag end should protrude perpendicular to the knot. Mm -hmm. And the non slip loop knot's done. Now, if you first attempts are big loops, it's not the end of the world. So that's the whole thing. There's your coronamid pattern in this case, but it could be a mayfly nymph. It could be a scud, it could be a leech, whatever you'd like it to be, up to the swivel. So that's about four and a half feet or so. And we added about three feet of extension and then to our 12 foot main leader. And you have a naked leader built and ready to go. So Phil, I noticed you've got some, um, shall we say, odd looking flies. Odd would be a good description. Odd, loud, gaudy. Yeah, yeah. And in still waters, we do use attractor flies. And it's based on the premise that trout don't always take our flies out of a feeding response. We're triggering an aggressive response, one out of curiosity, perhaps territoriality, but we're basically our time on the water is limited, and if, if the imitative stuff isn't working, then we're going to try some attractor techniques on mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. And primarily, we're using larger flies, gaudy, as you can see by the fluorescent colors, and we're moving them at pace. 
So the four I use the most often are the booby, which uh, so named for its round foam eyeballs. Mm-hmm. Okay, came uh, from the UK. The right? UK, yeah. Y- 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 sorry, the UK anglers. Um, they are real um, believers and use a lot of attractor techniques. Mm-hmm. Um, stocked fish are very susceptible to attractor techniques because they're curious, they sample everything. A friend of mine once said, they're like a two-year-old, everything's in their mouth, Mm -hmm. so (laughs) same kind of thing. But that's where the booby originated from, so it's got its foam eyeballs, and this fly wobbles, and we fish these aggressively, like three to five inch strip retrieve, strip pause retrieve, so that's going to uh, pull the fly down on the strip, and then it'll sort of hover or suspend for a second, and then you pull it down, and these eyes cause the flies to shake. Some boobies feature Short little marabou tails. Some anglers prefer long tails. Yeah. Um, lots of different color combinations. This is probably if you had one color combination in a tractor, we call it tequila. Mm-hmm. The orange front with the fluorescent orange rear. All right. Now the booby in England was starting to become banned. So uh, competitions are very common over there. And I believe it was a Scottish team. Um, sort of figured it out, well, they banned flies with foam in the front, so if I put foam in the back, technically it's okay. Uh-huh. And this is a this is what they came up with. So if you were to take this fly just like this, this is called a blob. So a blob is, this is called uh, Fritz material they use. There's original Fritz, jelly Fritz, slush. There's a whole pile of different tying materials out here. That just by itself, so a blob has no foam in it, right? right? Sometimes you put bead heads on uh, blobs as well, but this has a little split foam tail because when you split the foam, it actually increases its buoyancy. So this is called a fab. A fab. Which stands for foam arsed blob. (laughs) (laughs) And sometimes in competitions, if you're fishing flies, because people get, you know, want to know what you're using, to mislead their comp competitors at the end of the day they could come in and literally pinch that foam tail off and everybody thought they were using a blob and not a fab because when you strip this fly rather than it wobbling so much this fly tends to on the pause the foam end tips up so this fly has more of a this kind of action to it and i'm i like using fabs i have a lot of success using those i talked about the blob yeah this is the blob here it's just a blob of uh, this is slush jelly chenille, this fritz, again, I talked about jelly fritz, all these bright, gaudy materials. I like putting a little flash tail on it, and this one has a bead head, so we can cast and strip these. But one of the other advantages of a small bead-headed blob, just tied on a scud hook, is we fish them like you would fish a balanced leech, a coronamid, below an indicator. So when trout get on zooplankton, We don't tie size 96 flies. (laughs) So what we're trying to do here is imitate the various colors. Zooplankton come in, sort of a reddish pink, um, chartreuse, orange, um, those kind of colors as well. And we just suspend these under an indicator and wait for the pull down. And then, as the mop has come to the Stillwater Attractor World. And this is a pattern, again, another English pattern. I actually tie these on a jig hook. So the ride hook point up and we can again, I've had luck suspending these under an indicator or stripping them. And this, the English version of this fly is called a what's it because the tail represents a what's it corn chip or crisp. So that's where it comes from and it's the same. So it's a blob with a mop tail. Yeah, with a mop tail. So they're all equally effective. Uh Um, So the only thing you've got to be careful with um, using buoyant flies on trout, if you go with a slow retrieve, um, and pause the fly, because the fly has some buoyancy in it, it'll kind of suspend or even rise slightly, you lose connection with the fly. So there's an element of slack in there. The fish comes up, samples the fly, feels no resistance, and can swallow it and take the flies quite deeply. Oh. So you always want to fish buoyant <clears throat> flies with pace, so you never lose connection. Always quick strip retrieves. Um, never want to let that fly just sit and suspend. So far we've been talking about fishing a single fly, but you fish droppers a lot. You fish more multiple flies, right? Yeah, I'm a big believer in multiple flies. Mm-hmm. Obviously, we're legal to do so. Uh, and there are a number of different options, so we'll just walk our way through those, the pros and the cons. Okay. Um, the first one I've got, and I've got them rigged up here for demonstration purposes, but the first one is your standard, what I call the tandem. 
rigging where you will tie uh, a section of tippet using a clinch knot or improved clinch knot to the bend of the upper fly mm -hmm. and then hang your dropper off that. Yep. Pros of this method for me are if you're new to fishing multiple flies, this is probably the least tangle prone system. Mm -hmm. All right. Easiest to easiest to make. Yep. And when when you're casting, one follows the other. Mm -hmm. Right? The drawbacks to this method that I don't like is, um, well, if the fish takes the upper fly, sometimes during the, often during the course of the battle, the teeth or whatever, the other, the tippet somehow disappears and, and now you've lost, this fly is gone, mm -hmm. right? I also worry sometimes when you're vertically fishing that a fish comes in to take the fly like this, tries to take it and his nose actually, his snout and his lower jaw hits this leader, either he senses it or he pushes it out of his way and he misses the fly. I like, if, if my preference, I like to have my flies working alone from each other, mm -hmm. independently. Mm -hmm. So this fly is working and I get that achieved on the upper fly by it hanging off a separate dropper tag. Mm -hmm. So what I've done here is I tie a triple surgeon's knot and when I'm uh, tying the knot, I adjust the tag ends so I'm going to have a long tag end and a, sh and a short one, and I keep the long one. And the tag end I use is the one that's going to be on the point side of the fly. So it's actually the material that's coming off the fly, uh, the fly line end. And the reason I like that is because if a fish grabs this fly and pulls on it, it's sort of pulling in the direction the knot was formed. Right. Yeah. Whereas if it came off the top end, it could pull down and it would stress it and, and could cause breakage. So it hangs like this, but this is is a little can be a little tangle prone because this dropper hangs parallel or twists around. So one of the things we do, I'll just put my glasses on, is we, and I, I would do this, this is all rigged up ready to go, but I would typically do this before I tie the fly on. But actually, on the on the um, fly, the point fly side of the knot, I would form create a half hitch. So I just come across like so. I would pass that tag end through. It's a little more challenging with a fly on it, right? Mm -hmm. And then cinch that up, pull on this and cinch it. And what I've done is I've tied a, when I snug it, I've tied a half hitch and you'll notice now that the extends, extends out. out. Yeah. Uh -huh. The other okay. benefit of this um, with the stiffer material, if you get a grab, we call this a telltale dropper. So if a fish takes this fly and tugs and misses, right, what tends to happen is that, see how that more drooped? Mm -hmm. So that gives you a clue that this, the fish actually ate the upper fly, mm. which can give you clues to size of fly, color, more arguably, it's about, to me, it's depth, mm -hmm. right? Because that's one of the critical elements. And then to reset it, you would just sort of pull on everything, snug it up again, and you back out everything sort of hanging perpendicular again. Again, I like this system because the flies are working independently, all right? Flies are easy to change, right? right. Um, but you are going to consume dropper length. The drawbacks of this method, and this comes to, true when we're, we're fishing um, long leader techniques that we call naked technique, where the leader length is part of the success of that method, you start making fly changes, and all of a sudden, over time, you are shortening the length of your leader, and you could be pulling yourself out of the strike zone, you don't even really know it, because of all the leader changes, putting a new section of tippet in, redoing everything, you could accidentally shorten up your leader. Now, the alternative to this is when you're consuming that dropper, right, and you don't have to take to uh, retie it, you can use probably my favorite method, and that's called the sliding dropper. And what I've set up there is I used a swivel, because this novel, sorry, this knot works that there's a stopper between the point fly and the dropper, okay? So that stopper, in this case, is a swivel, mm -hmm. but it could also be a triple surgeon's knot or a blood knot, whatever tippet connection knots you like to use. Right. So what we do to add the dropper, put that down for a second, is I've got, and again, I put the fly on just for demonstration purposes, you would do it without the fly, but I tied a perfection loop in maybe six or eight inches of tippet material, and I'm going to take that loop 
and I'm going to loop it under the leader on the fly line side of the stopper, which in this case is the swivel, and I'm going to carefully pass the fly through. Normally it would just be the, tech, the tip of the, of the uh, tippet section you're adding, the dropper section, and I'm going to pull on this and basically loop it around the leader, and I like to slide it an inch or two above the stopper. And again, that stopper could be a triple surgeon's knot, a blood knot, or in this case, a swivel. Mm -hmm. And now you've got a dropper that you can add on. And because this rotates around a little bit, it, it tends to tangle less because the uh, dropper isn't coming off at a fixed angle. It has the ability to move around, mm -hmm. okay? And it also acts as like a telltale dropper. If, the, if you're fishing an indicator situation like this, a fish comes along and grabs this fly and you miss them, the tension of you missing the strike and the fish pulling on the fly will send that dropper down to the stopper so you know that that fish ate the upper fly. Mm -hmm. The beauty of this method, why I like it, is again, talking about a, a technique like that long leader nymphing where leader length is a critical component, you never adjust your main leader. It's always the same length because you're just adding that onto. And you can add and subtract flies because there are situations you want to take the dropper off. Typically fishing shallow, weedy areas, you hook a fish on one fly, the other fly goes around and hooks every other chunk of weed, and mm -hmm. you lose that big fish. Flash. The steady retrieve. Yep. Yeah, every fish has come from that direction, haven't they? So we're picking up a pattern. That's what you do in this still water stuff, huh, oh, Phil? Remember? You pick up a pattern. Like I said, it's like shampoo. Rinse and repeat once you Rinse figure it out. Rinse and repeat. Okay. What this we're looks going like to a do. Cutty. All right. There we go. We're just going to depress the bulb down the throat. And there you go. Nothing. Oh, something went up. I saw some green. So Did you? We'll let them go. Okay. I got a little. Tuck it up a bit. Oh. What is that? That, my friends, is zooplankton. Oh my god. So, zooplankton feeds on phytoplankton. Phytoplankton does not like light. So generally during the daylight hours, it descends down. So this is usually an indication of deep water feeding, but these aren't, I've got my glasses on, but are they even moving around? No. Well, there's a yeah. few, there's a few quivering. So how are the fish eating these? They're just going along and grazing? Like they a... just almost filter feed, mouth uh -huh. agape, and just swim through the clouds uh -huh. on them. In the summer months, in deeper lakes, they'll, they accumulate right along the thermocline yeah. where, the, where the lake stratifies, oh. and the trout just go. So there's and, concentrations of them in yeah, certain areas. Yeah, and uh -huh. they'll actually show up on a sounder too. Mm -hmm. And they're rich in, they're, they're, uh, rich in calories. They're an easy meal and trout root can really get on them and they, believe it or not, it'll make them grow. You wouldn't think, but it'll make them grow. I hope you enjoyed this guide to advanced stillwater angling. Um, Phil, there's certainly a lot more to it than I thought, and it's fascinating, and I learned so much from you, so I really appreciate that. Well, thank you, Tom. Um, I always like to teach and, and, and uh, get more and more people interested in stillwater fly fishing, because I, I think it really offers a lot for the fly fisher. And I hope it also gets some more people coming over so you can have more peace and quiet on your favorite rivers and streams, because <laughs> they're all over with me on the lakes. Well, your enthusiasm is contagious, so thank you. Thank you, Tom. The Orvis Guide to Fly Fishing is supported by Orvis Fly Fishing. Adipose Boat Works. Global Rescue. Trout Unlimited. Oscar Blues Brewery. <laughs>